Attorney, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to so what lodge you're from. Pardon? Say hello and tell me what lodge you're from. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm from uh, Worcestershire, a Worcestershire lodge, Harmonic Lodge, 252. Excellent. Consecrated 1784. <laughs> Very good. Are you good at that time, Ronnie? 1784. Yep. Were you the first master then? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, no, but he signed the first master's petition. <laughs> <laughs> it's all up there. <laughs> He's a couple of months younger than he looked. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh our speaker today, assuming he joins us, uh, is Brother Joe. Let me get his name right. He is Joe Fernando. Yeah, Joe Martinez um, from Northern Virginia. I forget what lodge he belongs to. That should be most Very interesting. Nice. And we're already at 10 o'clock. All right. I'm not worried. No. <laughs> well. Oh. Okay. And what do I have? You have Joe okay. join us G40G. Okay, John's trying to get in there, Brian. Uh, okay, he's not okay. showing up at the moment, Steve. Sorry about that. He's not showing up. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, I must have. Copied the password down wrong. Hang on. Okay, mate, I'll send it to him again. Yes, sir. If you could write to yep, his no uh, Facebook. Yeah, no problem, mate. Uh, chat. That'll be all right. I could have missed something. You might have missed part of it, yeah. Yeah, I know you have evening 40 G, like 40 grams, but. Well, I don't. Maybe the G is capital. That's right, too. Um, there was a brother from Canada who was on here last week or the week before. We were talking about traditional observance. Cameron, I think you know him. Yeah, it's probably Neil, uh, right, which brother, Neil Dolson. I think yeah. that's who it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he should be on. He quite often is. Okay, I want to yeah, talk to him. He had a paper he was going to share with me to use next week. Yeah, yeah. He. It's wonderful to, I've heard it once already, he'll... Perhaps, um, you mean share it or do it for us? Um, share it for he said, he said either, I, I don't know if he wanted me to read it or if he was going to read it, but either way, because we I wanted to talk about traditional observance lodge next week. I know, there, we have, we only had two of them for quite a long time and now we have three in Ontario. Okay. Uh, one opened in West Toronto and there's one e uh, towards Kingston uh, along the lake, and then the one that he's from is called uh, uh, Templum Lucius 747, like the aircraft. <laughs> okay. But it seems to be the most, well, the, the new one obviously is just starting out, and mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to be the most vibrant one. Okay. Oh. London. Well, I mean, not as far you know what I mean. As far as I've noticed, uh, they they've got some uh, Zoom educational meetings too, which he might share. Um, they're very good, actually. Okay. Uh, he could share with Brian and you, uh, Christopher, maybe. Oh, there, there is the pig. Hammy just walked by. For those who are asking about the pig. Yes. <laughs> no, but you know the only thing for the the chaps. The other way, either side of the oceans there, it's a little, it's at uh, seven or seven, seven o'clock or 7 uh -huh. p.m. in the evening. So right. it's hard for the UK and- Well, well, no, it's it's three in the afternoon now, is it not, Brian? Yeah. Okay, it's three o'clock in the UK. In the UK, yes, but yeah. yeah, when you add uh, nine hours, it's not the same time. Right. Um, but, oh yes, yeah. oh no, if he does it here, correct. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about for here. 
Um, well, I don't know if I need him to do a full paper, but if he wants to summarize, because I really wanted to have a more of a discussion, but I wanted oh, to have yeah. some points. Um, not to too long. It's not too long. Maybe twenty okay. minutes. Half hour. Oh, okay. Because um, that's something that I've been interested in, and I really want to mm -hmm. talk to those who are actually members of a traditional observance lodge and get their input. So there was a lot of interest in it last time, so we decided to mm -hmm. make a full dedicate a full show to just talking about that. So, okay, we'll have something put together. I'll, so uh, mess, what's his name again? Somebody messaged me his name, put in the chat. Uh, Neil, N-E-I-L, D-O-L-S-O-N, correct. Okay, okay. I'm sure he's in our group, so I'll reach out to him. Here, chatting. A moment on the asset group. Come on, here. I'm, he's chatting on our group there, Brian. I'm going to say, come on over. Okay, great. About yep, right. people, I've already sent it. Oh, John's in. I'm no need, oh, send you that link then, John. <laughs> no, that's true, Brian. I'm, uh, <laughs> I, try, I, I, I have to faff around a bit because I'm on the iPad rather than the laptop. But, you know, uh, good afternoon, yes. or good afternoon, brethren. <laughs> Hello, brother Hello. iPad. Good to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I can change my name on the computer, but on the iPad, it, I, I just, it's too much faffing. Well, it's, if you change it before you sign in, it's easy to change. But once you're in, you can't. I found that. Yeah. Bri so, Brian will tell you, I, I come up with all sorts of names. My other half sometimes right. uses Zoom, so I come up as her sometimes. Oh, yeah, that, that happens. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon, brothers. Yeah, let's get to join you. Brother John, you, brother. there he is. Hey. And, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, I wanted to welcome uh, back Brother Ranesh. Good to have you here, Brother. Hi. Nice one. Good to see you, Brother John. It's good to see you, Brother Steve. Uh, yeah, it's great. it's great to see you. Everybody. We, were, uh, we were hoping that we get you in there. Sorry about my little glitch on one letter or something. No, it's okay, man. It's no problem. It's duly noted. It's, yeah. Oh, you're really holding good. that against me, are you? Nice, nice. <laughs> no, no, I'm not holding that against you, no. Uh, well, Brother Martinez, good to see you this morning. You had me concerned. <laughs> it's okay. I can fill an hour with chatter. These guys will tell you. <laughs> Yeah, we. Know. I have no trouble droning on for an hour. By the way, if you haven't seen it on the group, um, I have uploaded the last three weeks to YouTube. I um, I upgraded my video pad software and finally got my registration issue with them settled, so I can actually use oh, what I paid for, which is good. But video pad is excellent. I'd recommend it. It's by NCH Software, and it's great for creating videos. So I basically, I basically just pull in the one that I record. And I just trim the beginning and the end and cut out some of the startup stuff. But it's great for um, someone who's not really uh, an expert on video editing. It's pretty easy to work with. So um, what I plan to do on YouTube is to find the minutes where the actual speaker begins and put that in as a bookmark for people. Because some of you may enjoy watching an hour and a half of us just talking back and forth with 20 minutes of content in the middle. But... I figure I'll make it easy for someone who just want to jump in and get right to the speech, get to the paper, because all I have to do is find the time where it starts, and I can post that as a separate link, and so that might be easier for some folks. So. Sounds good. Oh, and still have people coming in. We'll wait a few minutes, make sure everybody's joined us. And yeah, just. I just sent a, something to Neil, so hopefully he'll come. Okay, back. yep, we'll give him a minute or two. He, he has responded, mate. Uh, it's in the ESSA chat. Okay. I know, I know, brother. Yeah, I know, I know this. That's why. Yeah, he's can quit. Problems at the moment. I'm starting to recognize some of y'all here, so this is good. Some of y'all are yeah, that's good, becoming brother. regulars, that's yes. Good. We like we like a return attendees, by all means. Of course. Obviously, not everyone's going to be able to attend everyone, but uh, some of y'all are making an effort to attend regularly, and that's great to see. Well, we spread the word amongst our good brothers that we know that's we'll good. enjoy it. That's good. Morning, Brother Felty. Good to see you here with your professional broadcaster picture going on. <laughs> Don't you like you should be on Sports Center or something? I'm John Felty. This is NFL Tonight. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, no, it's a wonderful day, sir. Hey, good Thank to see you. you. Good evening, Neil. Good afternoon, Neil. Oh, damn it. Good morning, Neil. Good morning. I'm having hey, computer there problems. There he is. But... Hey, brother. Oh, I'm glad you made it. Brother yeah, Neil, good to see you. I'm having computer problems, so I logged in on my phone. Uh, that'll work. Well, I, you know, Neil, that's what I use quite a bit. It works fine. Yeah. Except the picture might be a bit smaller or something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's framed a little bit, but that's not a big deal. Brother Elias, thank you for joining us. You want to say hello? Say what lodge you're from. Unmute. You need to unmute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see he's not. Hello. Yeah. Brother Elias, how are you? Where are you from, brother? Fine, fine. I'm from Kerala, 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 Calicut, India, India. Excellent. That's, yeah. So what time is it in your city? Yeah. What time is it in India? India, it's 8, 845. Okay. That's still not too bad. I think yeah. this has been a good time. I'm always worried about the time since we have so many of you that are coming from other countries, which is amazing to yeah, me. Yeah. If I think about it, it's like, why did we have this crap when I was in the military, man? I was stationed in Okinawa, and I was 11 hours behind the East Coast, and could yeah, I rarely got to call anyone, but if we could use Zoom, <laughs> I would have been awesome, you know? But, thank you, thank you. Hi, Brother Chris. Hey, good to see you, Brother Renesh. I shouted out to you earlier. I guess you didn't hear me. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I, I was actually attending another meeting, which is going on. <laughs> oh, that's right. You, that's right. You are doing this nonstop. <laughs> okay. Quick question regarding yes. the research lodge link, which you sent the YouTube link, is yes. it under the banner of the square and compass itself or that's it. YouTube no, channel's that's, name shows as square and compass. That's promotion. not, that's not one I sent. That is one that brother um, uh, Cameron, Cameron sent. Uh -huh. That is the name of his production company for um, okay. for Windsor Lodge. The ones who gave a talk, uh, he was the one who gave a talk about the Windsor Temple in Ontario. Uh huh. But because we share their stuff. I... Oh, okay, okay. Wait. No, because when I tried searching for Virginia Research, I thought maybe we are recording it somewhere on YouTube. We are or something. Oh, yes. we are. If you look at the Facebook page, I just uploaded the videos. I've been uploading oh. them. They're actually under my handle. My channel is called Cigar Doug because okay. I already had a, a, a YouTube channel. So I'm just promoting that one. Um, but I put the links in our Facebook group. Okay, cool. I'll take a look at that. Thank you. And we have over 100 subscribers, which is great. I've been trying to get a vanity URL and they haven't given mm. me one yet. Cameron, did you get a vanity URL for your YouTube channel? Uh, yeah, once you get over 100 subscribers, you can... Um... I know, you're supposed to. I'm waiting. I just went... I'm at like 103. So nice. it may take a little while for them to process. But that's great because if you get a... YouTube, anyone can make a YouTube channel. But it's like YouTube.com slash and a bunch of letters and numbers. Once you have oh, yeah. enough subscribers, they let you customize the end URL. Oh, so I made a... I made a tiny URL that I've been using. I'll put that out there. Chat. Um, but I really wanted a custom one within YouTube. That's why I've been asking people to um, um, to subscribe so I can get over um, 100 subscribers. I put it in the chat here. Oh, I do not want to direct message Michael. I guess he left. There we go. Uh, Christopher, um, yeah. where's your brother Alan Lockhart from St. Andrew's Lodge number 25 in Scotland? Send mm -hmm. his best regards. He'll try to make the next one. Oh, well, thank you. He's helping a buddy. Uh, John Mallon knows him. Um, he's helping a buddy um, sell his used car, so that might take a while. <laughs> I don't know whether he set up a lemonade stand to increase traffic. I'm not sure what he's doing. All right. Well, well, we don't. I, I appreciate that. We don't need you all to acknowledge if you can't be here, but it's nice to hear. <laughs> no, no, no. He, he wanted to come, and then this popped up. I understand. 
But yeah, so for, but we do appreciate any subscribers to the channel uh, that lets us do more things with YouTube, but uh, it's sort of under my brand for now. Um, if we get super huge, I'll make a separate channel, but then we have to rebuild the subscribers again. So, all right. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, all of the, all of these, all of our um, meetings since our December meeting, in fact, including the ones I did back in August, they're all on YouTube. So they're all people can go and watch them again. Wonderful. Yeah. See, Christopher, it's uh, um, it, it's surprising. I'm sorry. How many people have taken to Zoom meeting? It's a, it's strange that we have regular lodge meetings, and if we right. can't go to one, we kind of send our apologies, even though we don't have to. Right. <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying I don't expect it from anyone. But it's nice that people are making that effort. I only did it because he would be one of our new ones for you. So. Okay. Well, we're up to 25 participants, and I don't have a clock anymore. I'm full screen, and I can't see. 1017. 1017. I see it. It's funny. It's like all this stuff, and I'm like, I don't have a clock when I'm full screen. That's interesting. All right. So, yes, uh, Brother Martinez, if you're ready, I think we're going to go ahead and start with your paper. I will let you introduce yourself. That's easier. Go ahead and unmute. You're not muted. Nope. Joe is working on that technical difficulty, and he'll be with us in a minute. <laughs> I've known Joe for a good while. He's, uh, I know him from other research bodies, and I've act we met in person twice, I think, at DMLA events, so... He's a big sort of the Utes like I am, and uh, he works hard. He maintains. Well, I'll let him explain all the channels and stuff he sports, and I'll let him explain why he still has a Christmas tree, and it's uh, it's 15 days after um, after um, epiphany. Pe what's the word? Epiphany. Epiphany. Yes. I think <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. I got my headset on, so you don't hear my children screaming. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, please introduce yourself, and I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody else. Awesome. Uh, well, good morning, uh, brothers. My name is uh, Joe Martinez. Uh, I am a uh, Mason in my home lodge is in Virginia. Uh, I'm a member of Manassas Lodge number 182 in Manassas, Virginia. Uh, I'm also a member of a traditional observance lodge, uh, Benjamin B. French number 15 in the District of Columbia. Uh, I'm also a member of Ezekiel Bates Lodge in Attleboro, Massachusetts, and I am a member of Internet Lodge 9659 in the United Grand Lodge of England. Um, so I pay a lot of dues uh, that my wife doesn't know about. So um, uh, in addition to uh, Blue Lodge, which I love very much, uh, I'm also a member in a lot of appendant bodies, in Royal Arch and Commandry and the Shrine, AMD, basically anything that, that has anything related to masonry, I'm probably a member of. Um, in terms of uh, stuff that I like to do, I love education. Um, that is my, my primary goal and one of the reasons why I joined the craft. Um, so I'm really big into ed education. I'm one of the uh, admins of Refracted Light, the uh, Facebook group and YouTube channel uh, that uh, combined has about 4,500 subscribers. Um, so it's a group that's uh, open to everybody. Um, we don't restrict based on your membership. Um, and uh, we started up pretty much after the COVID lockdown started and provide Masonic or esoteric or spiritual education to people uh, at least two or three times a week. Um, and it comes from the United States, from Canada, from England. Um, we've had folks from Japan present, uh, Australia. So it's a good group. Um, so if you're looking for education um, or educational opportunities or things that you can bring to your lodge in addition to what Chris has put together, um, definitely check out Refracted Light. Um, again, it's open to all, it's not tiled, um, but I mean, none of the, none of the really good mysteries of Freemasonry really are tiled anyway. So um, with that, uh, that's my intro. And um, Chris, did you want me to go ahead and get started with the presentation or? Yes, please do. Okay. Let me uh, share my screen here and make sure I'm good to go. Oh, I can't share.
one sec while I figure that out. No worries. <laughs> okay. Um, all participants. Okay, go ahead and try. Okay. Oh, now. Yes. Awesome. I see started screen sharing. So yep. How about now? There we go. Excellent. Excellent. You're ready to go. Great. Let me uh, move this stuff around so I can see. Um, so again, uh, Worshipful Chris, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, brothers, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, uh, interrupt. Um, if I say something crazy, definitely please feel free to chime in. Um, and uh, I'll be monitoring the chat as well. Uh, otherwise, you can save your questions for the end and uh, hope that it sparks a good dialogue. So um, today we're going to talk about the, the old charges and Anderson's Constitution. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, basically the, the old charges as the framework for the switch from operative to speculative Freemasonry, or, or in other terms, the, the switch from you know, building physical buildings to building that spiritual temple. Um, again, there's nothing tiled in here, so please feel free to, to share this out. Um, and I know Worshipful Chris will stick it up on YouTube. Um, so please, please, please feel free to, uh, to add it to your educational content if it's something that you like. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So today what we're going to talk about is what comprises the old charges in and of itself. Um, it's more than one document. Um, within the old charges itself, we're going to talk about the history of the craft um, according to the old charges and according to things like Anderson's Constitution and, and why they're important to us as speculative Freemasons. Let's start with the old charges. So what the old charges are, if you've not heard their definition before, are basically ancient documents, documents that precede 1720 and that have come down to us from starting as early as the 14th century. And within them, the legends, the rules, and the regulations that are now incorporated as part of our quote unquote traditional history. Um, the physical makeup of these documents are found in the form of most oftentimes handwritten paper, uh, sometimes parchment, and each document or, or collection having either having been sewn or pasted together or are comprised as, as basically handwritten sheets that are stitched together in, in some sort of book form. Um, and then as we get later in time, uh, you'll start to see uh, more familiar printed books, um, but those come later. Um, some of these old manuscripts have been found to have been incorporated into the minutes books of lodges. Um, definitely operative lodges, some that were making the transition from operative to speculative. Um, and the old charges that we're going to talk about, the primary documents, the major documents that I have listed here, they range from about 1390 until about 1722. Um, a few of them are really good specimens of, of Gothic writing at the time, right? Before, before the time of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Um, most of these documents nowadays are incorporated and, and kept for safekeeping in the British Museum and also the Masonic Library of West Yorkshire. So before we start on the actual old charges, um, the ones that, that the United Grand Lodge of England likes to define, um, let's talk about some lesser known documents, which I think are equally as important. The first one we're gonna talk about are the Statutes of Bologna of 1248, okay? So it was titled the Statutes and Regulations of the Society of the Masters of Masonry and Carpentry. And this document was originally written in Latin by a, uh, what you would call a notary in the city of Bologna. Um, and is dated to about 1248. Um, so this manu manuscript is currently preserved in the state archives of the city of Bologna. Um, it really is a very important document in terms of the, the written history of Freemasonry. Um, and it's really ignored by scholars uh, because quite frankly, um, and I'm not slighting uh, my fellow brothers in UGLE, but um, the United Grand Lodge of England or even the premier Grand Lodge of England, um, they definitely focused on British history when it came to the rise of speculative Freemasonry um, with their incorporation as the, as the first Grand Lodge system. But this document was written about 140 years before the earliest old charge recognized by England. Um, 
and it really is the original Masonic document for the rules of operative masonry. Um, it's 142 years older than the Regis poem or the Hallowell manuscript, as we'll see in a bit, 180 years older than the Cook manuscript, and it's 200 years older than the Strasbourg manuscript, um, which Germany has recognized as uh, a very old operative Masonic document. Um, so this document, um, the Statutes of Bologna, what it talks about is a lot of the information that you'll find in Anderson's constitutions that were first penned in 1723. Um, and Anderson does admit that he drafted it after consulting the ancient statutes and regulations of operative masonry in Italy, Scotland, and some other parts of, of England. Um, but if you actually read the text, um, and you can see the text if you Google Statutes of Bologna, um, you'll get the, the information that you find in there. Um, it definitely talks about how you should comprise lodges, um, talking about uh, what you should do with apprentices, things like that. A lot of your operative masonry laws that we've now transposed into our speculative craft, you're going to find in this document. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is the Book of Trades, uh, which is a French document. Um, and its title is the Statutes and Rules of the Trade Unions of the Master Masons, Plasterers, and Mortarers. And this document was dated to about 1268. So again, almost 100 years before we find the Hallowell manuscript. Um, some interesting things of note, and this is the earliest time we'll ever see this in any sort of document, are these certain rules, that no one may have more than one apprentice at a time. And if he has one, he must keep him for six years of service, which is a little bit different than that seven years that you traditionally hear about. Um, he may well keep him beyond this time if the man is available, but now he has to pay him, right? So he can't be a free apprentice anymore. Um, and it talks about how they get paid and things like that. Oh, excuse me for one second. Sorry, it's Saturday morning in the Martinez house and the kids are running around. So, um, so back to the, uh, the Book of Trades. Um, some other uh, rules that it had for operative masons were that masters were with apprentices whose term of apprenticeship is fulfilled must come before the master of the guild and basically prove their skills. Um, so you have a basically uh, an early form of transitioning from one degree to the next, right? So your apprentice and the master that trained him need to come before the guild master and basically prove their skills in an, in an operative fashion before becoming you know, a, a master of their own. And then finally, we have the Avignon Decree. Um, so this is a papal bull, so it's not specifically a Masonic document, but it is one that's very important to its history. Um, and we can date this decree to 1326, again, 70 years before the Hallowell manuscript. But basically this papal, uh, the, this papal bull uh, talks about, and I quote, the radical suppression of societies, leagues, and conjurations, also referred to as brotherhood. Um, so this is way earlier than any of the papal bulls that you saw condemning Freemasonry or other secret societies, as they were called at the time. Um, but 1326, and this was the direct result of a lot of the operative um, guilds, not just Masonic ones, um, that were forming and becoming what they termed as brotherhoods, right? And it's going to talk about some of the things that that they're not allowed to do. Um, and let me see some of the interesting stuff. So basically, they, any any society that made you take an oath, this papal bull was in direct uh, opposition to. And they basically said that they forbid, under the penalty of excommunication, um, that they're allowed to assemble, meet, gather, and take any oath that deals with such practices, uh, organize as brotherhoods, subject themselves to the obedience of another, help and support each other mutually. So this papal bull said they're not allowed to help each and support each other mutually. Wear any costumes or identification signifying what from what is now a forbidden activity. And finally, style themselves brothers or masters of any said society. So as far back as 1326, um, this papal bull prohibited you getting together with the title of master, having an apprentice, taking an oath, having any sort of ritualistic uh, bond of brotherhood be clean in amongst each other. So now let's talk about the traditional old charges. Um, these are the documents that you'll find mostly British in history uh, that are defined if you go to Wikipedia or any other sort of uh, Grand Lodge website that talks about the old charges. This is the, the primary documents that you're going to start to see. And we're going to talk about the Hallowell manuscript, which is also incorrectly known as the Regis poem. It contains the Regis poem, but the actual document itself is the Hallowell manuscript. 
Um, then the second oldest of the traditional old charges is the Cook manuscript. And finally, we'll talk about the Dowlin manuscript. So the Hallowell manuscript is the earliest of the traditional quote unquote old charges. Um, it consists of 54 vellum pages uh, that were written in Middle English. Um, and this is the only set of documents contained within the old charges that was written all in poetry and rhyming couplets. Every other document was written in a prose style. Um, and that's why it's oftentimes referred to as a Regis poem because it is, it is written in poetic form. Um, this poem uh, talks about uh, basically the history of the craft and describes how Euclid counterfeited geometry and called it masonry for the employment of the children of the nobility of ancient Egypt. Um, and this term counterfeited, um, if any of you actually know uh, Sean Iyer, uh, he does a, uh, Brother Sean Iyer, he's uh, one of the folks that work at the uh, George Washington Masonic Memorial. Um, and he's actually been doing an, an online class on ancient documents um, in the craft. Um, absolutely, purely academic class. It is phenomenal. Um, so if you guys want to support the George Washington Memorial, um, go to his Facebook page. It's called uh, the Formation Study Group. Um, and I'm not advertising for him because I don't get anything back, but um, he does talk in an academic and historical way about some of these old documents. And one thing that uh, I did take that class uh, over the summer, and um, one of the things he talked about was the term how Euclid counterfeited geometry. So back in the in the 14th century, the term counterfeited doesn't mean what it means today. It doesn't mean you know illegal theft or copying. Um, it actually meant imitated. So uh, it didn't have as negative as of a slant as the first time I read. Uh, the Hallowell manuscript. So Euclid imitated geometry and called it masonry. Um, and this document talks about that allegorical and, and legendary history of the craft. Um, so then it goes from uh, Euclid and ancient Egypt, and then it talks about the spread of the art of geometry or masonry to diverse lands, um, and then how the craft of masonry was finally brought to, yep, we'll do, um, and, and talks about how uh, masonry or geometry spread throughout the world and finally ended up back in England um, during the reign of King Athelstan. Uh, those of you that are members of different appended bodies, um, uh, you definitely heard, depending on the appended body you're in, that King Athelstan is very, very important to the, the legend of the York Rite. Um, so him being British or this document being British, it definitely talks about that. Um, it talks about how all the masons of the land came to the king, Athelstan, uh, for direction as how to be governed and how then Athelstan, you know, together with the nobility and the landed gentry, uh, created the 15 articles and 15 points for the rule and government of masons. Again, we're starting to, this is things that we're starting to, that are starting to sound very familiar to a lot of the documents that we use uh, to create our grand lodges and our grand jurisdictions. Um, so first you have 15 articles for the master, and these are specifically for the master, uh, concerning the moral behavior of its members, you know, things like not taking bribes to attend church regularly, things like that, and how to work on a building site. Um, don't make your masons labor at night, teach apprentices properly, you know, don't uh, don't hold back on, on their education, and don't take jobs that you can't do. Again, it's primarily operative. Um, then it goes into 15 points for the craftsmen, which follow, uh, that's exactly right, Ranesh, uh, the Masonic Order of Athelstan. If you are a member, um, you get into this, this, this uh, legend in much detail, which I'm not gonna go into here. Um, so then you talk about 15 points for the craftsmen and it talks about warnings of punishments for breaking the rules um, that were created during this annual assembly. Um, Punishments that you may be familiar with if you've gone through craft Masonic lodges, which I'm not going to detail here. So this document was named, and you'll see a lot of these documents aren't named for their authors because realistically you don't know who authored these documents, right? A lot of them were not signed. Um, but it was named after a non-Mason, James Hallowell, who published the poem in a paper called The Early History of Freemasonry in England uh, that was read before the Society of Antiquaries in 1838. And this document took so long to be found because it was not originally cataloged as a Masonic document. And it was a document categorized as a poem of moral duties entitled The Constitutions of the Art of Geometry by Euclid. So it had nothing in the title relating to uh, operative or speculative Freemasonry. And for hundreds of years, it was miscataloged.
Now let's talk about the Cook manuscript. This is the second oldest of the traditional old charges, or uh, you may have heard them called the Gothic Constitutions of Freemasonry. Um, and it's the oldest set of charges that were written entirely in prose. Um, and all the other ones are written in prose, right? So Hallowell um, was a little bit cool. He wrote it in poetic style, which those of you who learn ritual, um, you may get some of that uh, in, your, in your ritual. Um, it does contain some repetition uh, to the Hallowell manuscript, but compared to the Hallowell manuscript, there's a lot of new material. And the Cook manuscript is where you're going to find a lot of the material that you're going to see in later constitutions. Um, you're also going to find a lot of it in uh, a lot of Himan Razones, um, which become those, those documents that govern grand jurisdiction. Uh, and some of you may even call your constitution still the Himan Razon. Um, he gets into, uh, in the Cook manuscript, you get a lot of synergy here between um, ancient legend and biblical history or his, you know, historicity. Um, because it incorporates a lot of Old Testament information in this manuscript. So you talk about um, the Cook manuscript focuses a lot on the children of Lamech um, that you find in the book of Genesis and his children and what the arts and sciences that they discover. So Jabal discovered geometry um, and became basically the first master mason uh, from the line of Cain. Jubal discovered music. Tubal Cain, you may have heard that name before, discovered metallurgy and the art of smithing. And then Lamech's daughter, Nama, invented weaving. So these were all the traditional ancient sciences, according to the Cook manuscript, that were the, the ancient arts and sciences that were divinely inspired and brought to man by God, right? Um, so discovering that the earth would be destroyed either by fire or by flood, um, these children of Lamech inscribed all of their knowledge onto two pillars of stone, um, one that would be impervious to fire and one that would not sink. Um, Again, if any of you have gone through the fellow craft degree, um, especially in, in the United States, you would have heard this uh, or a similar story told before. Um, so then generations after the flood, both pillars were lost and then finally discovered. Um, and according to the Cook manuscript, one is discovered by Pythagoras and the other by the philosopher Hermes. So from there, the seven sciences were then passed down through Nimrod. You may have heard that name in the Bible before. He was the architect of the Tower of Babel, um, passed down from Nimrod to Abraham who Abraham, who taught them to the Egyptians. Um, and this is where Euclid picks up. So it picks up the history um, that you see in Hallowell. Um, and it picks up with Euclid, who in turn taught masonry to the children of the nobility of ancient Egypt. The craft then travels from Egypt to the children of Israel and from the Temple of Solomon, finds its way through France and then back into St. Albans, England. Um, and you know, Alban is the father of Athelstan, and Athelstan now becomes one of a line of kings that actively supports operative masonry. Um, and he becomes the unofficial leader and mentor of Mason. Uh, the Cook manuscript also includes nine articles and nine points, some which are similar to the Hallowell manuscript. Um, and it picks up the traditional history from there. Um, again, these are primarily British documents, right? So it contains a lot of British specific history when it comes to uh, operative masonry and its, its rise and prominence in, in England. Now we have the Dowden manuscript. Um, and I picked this one over the Graham manuscript, which you may have heard of, uh, only because it's a tiny bit older and it does contain some really useful information um, when we're talking about uh, how the old charges were constructed. So the Dowden manuscript was first printed in a gentleman's magazine in 1815. Um, and again, its contributor is named after the person who republished it, right? And not necessarily its original author. Um, his name is James Dallin, and he wrote, for the gratification of your readers, I send you a curious address respecting Freemasonry, which not long since came into my possession. It is written on a long roll of parchment in a very clear hand, apparently in the 17th century, and probably was copied from a manuscript of an earlier date. So scholars have dated the earlier manuscripts around 1500 to 1550 based on its writing style um, and the documents and the, the actual uh, paper and stuff that was used to make the document. So this really is the second oldest prose constitution known. It is older than Graham. But here's where you're going to see, you see a lot of similar information. You see things about Euclid and Egypt's nobility. Um, you do have references to King Hiram of Tyre um, and then the transmission of information all the way to Adnan. Um, and again, it, it goes through France to England um, and the restoration of that science by King Athelstan. Um, but what you do see here, um, that you don't see in the other old charges is information about the wages 
paid to members of the craft. This is the first time you see that. So, excuse me, those of you that have gone through the fellow craft degree, um, talking about wages, here's where you see information about those wages from an operative standpoint. This is the earliest known time you'll see that in any sort of manuscript. Um, the original was lost, and uh, you do have the manuscript that was a, a copy of it. Um, but the history, the traditional or legend history, um, is similar to that of the Cook manuscript. You know, you see Euclid to the Egyptian lords and sons. Um, you do find the name of a master mason at the construction of the Temple of Solomon. Um, and then again, masonry diffusing from the temple itself through France. The British, I guess, liked France at the time because they do reference them a lot. I know you guys don't super get along nowadays, but uh, back then um, there was a lot of love for them and you end up in St. Albans, England. Um, but then you do see a uh, reduction in human knowledge based on the science. So the science basically gets lost a little bit, but is restored under Athelstan and then picks up again that traditional York Rite legend. Um, but then it travels past Athelstan to more recent kings of England um, and their, their, paten, uh, their patronage of, of masonry. So why are these old charges important other than being pretty and uh, containing ancient legends and allegories, but they, they do show that a there was a history that preceded the organization of the first or premier Grand Lodge of England in 1717 or 1721, depending on when you celebrate his birthday. Um, they do show that fundamental lineage of some of the mysteries that were passed from the ancient civilizations to the Masonic guild systems of the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, most of them discuss a chronology of that knowledge as far back as, as the Adam archetype, right? Um, they contain information from pre nicaea writings, um, which I find really interesting, and I've actually done uh, a good bit of research into this. There's information contained in these old charges that existed um, in documents that we would call things like the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that were suppressed by you know, the, the Roman church uh, for a long time and not rediscovered until World War II. All of these documents talk about the importance of geometry as the primary science. Geometry and masonry were completely uh, interchangeable terms in all of these documents. And, and most of these serve as, as a gap fill between the building of Solomon's temple and our traditional Hermetic legend and the guild system of, of the post Middle Ages. So they really bridge that gap between 1000 BCE or around the time when we think the Temple of Solomon would have been constructed to, again, the formation of the Premier Grand Lodge. Now I'm going to talk about the Grand Manuscript as a bonus. Um, so the Grand Manuscript was penned around 1725 or 1726, so it's after the formation of the Premier Grand Lodge, and that's why I don't consider it one of the old charges, because those documents really precede the formation of the Grand Lodge of England. Um, but it gives a version of the third degree uh, or the master mason's degree. It gives a version of the legend that's now different than what's transmitted to master masons currently, right? That involves Noah instead of Hiram. So the grand manuscript appears to have been written in 1726, um, but there are some scribal indications. Yep, I'll get to that. Um, and sorry, the chat's up, so I'm seeing questions pop up, but I'll save all these for the end. Um, but the, the way that it's written indicates that it was copied from another document and was definitely earlier than 1725. Uh, it turned up in Yorkshire during the 1930s, but the exact origin is unknown. And as you may have suspected, it was named after the person who republished it. Um, but in the grand manuscript, there's an examination in the form of a, sort of a question and answer catechism that a lot of us are accustomed to, uh, those of us that go through a catechism-based uh, degree system. And in what appears to be the examination of a master mason, uh, the responder relates what modern masons would recognize that is part of the legend of Hiram, um, dealing with the recovery of his body. But in this instance, it's the body of Noah um, that was disinterred by his three sons in the hope of learning some secret. And the mason's word that is cryptically derived from, from the rotting corpse. Um, Hiram is mentioned, but only as Solomon's master craftsman, um, who was inspired by Bezalel, um, who performed the same functions for Moses. So those of you that are members of other appended bodies, you'll hear the name Bezalel um, in the degree systems, um, as well as other people that were in the Bible that constructed things like the Ark of the Covenant or the Tabernacle, things like that. Um, but this tradition of deriving Freemasonry from Noah seems to have been shared with James Anderson um, because he also attributes 
ancient Freemasonry to Noah um, in his uh, later constitutions, the 1738 constitution. Um, but really quickly putting it into modern language, and I'll be as, as broad as I can. Um, we have the tradition that Shem, Ham, and Japheth went to their father's grave to find some sort of valuable secret. Um, they had previously agreed that if they could not find his secret, the first thing they would find instead um, would become the substitute secret, because they believed that God would make the thing as valuable as the secret itself. This is starting to sound familiar, right? Um, so they came to the grave, finding nothing but a dead body that was rotting away. So they took certain grips at different parts of his body that I'm not going to elaborate here. And they finally reared up the dead body and supported it in a certain way that, again, if you've gone through um, the Master Mason's degree, as, as most of us do, um, either in the Preston Webb style or in the emulation style, it's identical to what you, um, you've seen before. Um, and then there is a... a cry uh, or a, a lamentation um, that's actually really beautiful. It says, oh, Father of heaven, help us now, for our earthly father cannot. Um, so then after they lay the body back down, there are certain things that they say that sound very familiar to, um, to the modern ritual. Uh, I'm not going to get into here, but just Google Grand Manuscript and read it, and you'll actually be surprised. Um, so after these lamentations, they agreed to give these things the name. Um, which is still used in Freemasonry to this day. Um, and it, they believe, according to the Grand Manuscript, um, that, that this virtue or the secret um, didn't come from what they found, but through faith and prayer. So it has definite religious undertones. And again, read the Grand Manuscript, you'll be really surprised uh, by what you see in there. But again, it has Noah and his three sons as the legend and not really following the Hermetic legend. But again, those of you who are Masonic scholars know um, the first instance of the Master Mason degree didn't show up until around 1725 or 1726, um, at least in writing. And we do know that before 1717, the, the traditional craft system was a two degree system, right? Um, and oh, a little footnote, uh, the first reference to Hiram, uh, to the Hiramic legend did not show up in any sort of official manuscript. It actually showed up in the very first Masonic expose, uh, Pritchard's Masonry Dissected in 1730, which was four years after this was written and about eight years or nine years after um, Anderson's original uh, constitutions. Um, that's where we see the Hiramic legend start to take place in a Masonic expose. Uh, those of you that are members of the UGLE, um, your history is actually kind of cool because a lot of your ritual, um, a lot of your current ritual books did not come from official Grand Lodge documents. It actually came from Masonic exposés that were written really well. Um, so there's actually a uh, Masonic Roundtable episode on uh, Masonic exposés. Um, so I, I urge you to check that out and I'll find a link for it as well. All right, so now let's delve into Anderson's Constitution. Um, this is the plate. Um, if any of you have uh, ever visited um, the Grand Lodge of England, their building, um, you'll see this. You'll see the original plate for it, uh, the Constitutions of the Freemasons. Um, you'll also see a later one. Those of you that have visited the GW Masonic Memorial, you'll see a later one that was printed by Benjamin Franklin. So I'll get into them themselves. Um, Anderson's Constitution is the first comprehensive work on Freemasonry. Um, it was originally published in 1723. It was first published in the United States in 1734 by Benjamin Franklin. Um, and uh, Ben Franklin's copy was a reprint of the work by James Anderson, um, who, poor James Anderson, he's never identified as the author of this work, um, except in a, a footnote in the appendix. Um, the folks who, who paid him to create this document, I guess, didn't want him to get any love, so he was not listed as its original author. Um, but he did sneak in a reference to his name in the appendix. So, yay, James. Um, this work contains a 40-page allegorical and, and um, historical history of masonry. And it starts from Adam uh, to the reign of King George I and includes uh, notable names such as Noah, Abraham, Moses, Solomon, Hiram Abiff, Nebuchadnezzar, Augustus Caesar, Vitruvius, uh, King Athelstan, Inigo Jones, and finally James I of England. Um, he has extended descriptions of the seven wonders of the ancient world, um, which we traditionally know as the Great Pyramid, Solomon's Temple, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Mausoleum, 
uh, the lighthouse at Alexandria, uh, the statue of Jupiter Olympus, and finally the Colossus at Rhodes, um, and talks about their construction as integral to the history of speculative Freemasonry, as well as operative Freemasonry. Um, and this document really is a celebration of the science of geometry and the royal art of architecture. This is where it first gets called the royal art. Um, that was practiced from ancient times until the then current revival of the Roman or Augustan style, which you saw in London and, and uh, surrounding parts of England at the time, you know, following the fire, um, the Great Fire of London. Uh, it also contains the charges of a Freemason and the general regulations concerning the rules and conduct for individuals and the governance of lodges and their officers. So this is the first comprehensive work on how to govern lodges, how to build the officer line, and, and what their jobs were to do. Um, this document suggests that masonry in its modern Anglo form uh, was rooted in Old Testament exegesis. Um, you know, things like, uh, and I quote, so that the Israelites at their leaving Egypt were a whole kingdom of Masons under the conduct of their Grand Master Moses. So Anderson's Constitution is going to contain a lot of these nuances that really start to give credence to that allegorical history of the craft. Um, before we delve into the actual contents of Anderson's Constitution, excuse me for a second. Sorry, I had to yell at the children again. Um, before we talk about the actual timeline uh, within Anderson's Constitution, we have to stop and talk about the Usher chronology because the Usher chronology is a chronology basically of the world from its creation to present time that Anderson uses. Um, quite frequently to talk about dates and times and try to take things like biblical history and, you know, transpose them on top of, you know, real physical history and, and merge the two together. So he does a really good job of doing that. Um, but the Usher chronology um, corresponds really closely to what Anderson uses um, because they use the same method to calculate key events that are recorded in the Bible. Um, so basically, Usher was a archbishop um, who constructed a chronology using just the Bible as, as a biblical source initially, and then actually used um, in a really good scientific way um, other collaborating sources, such as uh, documents of Roman history, tax records, things like that, um, to actually put together a definitive history of the world um, uh, from the creation all the way to modern times. So um, he uses uh, again, those, those reference dates that he knows of plus biblical history, and he gets more correct as he gets more recent to his own time, obviously, right? So basically, he talks about the creation of the world um, occurring, I believe it was around 3781 BC, um, all the way to the present time with the formation of, with the creation of Adam, and then using dates like how old Noah was when he died, and, and how old some of the other, um, uh, you know, Bible, figures were when they lived and when they died, things like that. So again, uh, if you want to know more about Usher chronology, just Google that. Um, it's actually really comprehensive and rather interesting to read. So let's talk about the actual history of the craft using that Usher chronology that we find in the old chargers. So they they called it the Anyo Mundi system. Um, I know Masons use the Anyo Lucha system, but Usher named his uh, Anyo Mundi, the year of the world. So the year of the world one is Adam. Our first parent created after the image of God, the great architect of the universe, who must have had the liberal sciences, particular geometry, written on his heart. Um, so again, you start to see that Anderson does a really good job of, of relating the history of the craft to um, the modern history at, at that time. Um, then we get to Noah at around 1757. Um, and then 1810, we get to Nimrod, who we know built the Tower of Babel. Um, then we get to Mithram. Um, who there was actually a, uh, a Masonic lineage and named after Mithram, Mithram uh, Memphis Mithram. Then we get to Abram, who was later named Abraham. And then we get the travels in Egypt and the uh, transmission of that knowledge through the, uh, the children of Egypt. Then we get to Bezalel, um, and we know what he did. Then we get to the land of Canaan, um, where the transmission of knowledge happened through Moses. And then finally, we get to the time of King Solomon.
then we go a little bit forward in time, we get to Pythagoras and Zerubbabel and the construction of the second temple. So those of you know uh, who Zerubbabel was, you know, if you're part of any appended body outside of craft masonry, he pops up in, in multiple um, in the construction of the second temple. Then we get to the traditional history of Euclid and we get to, um, and then we get to uh, Ptolemy II, who again was one of those uh, Hellenized kings of Egypt, and then to Archimedes, all the way to Augustus Caesar, who he references, um, you know, having taken that masonry and brought it into the Roman Empire, um, and then move forward in time, and, and you know that's where you get a lot of that architecture. Um, then we get to Saxon England, and then this is where we start to see some of that traditional um, British history. Um, and why British history is so prominent in the old charges, um, because they were the, the loudest supporters of them. Uh, but then we get to Martel and Athelstan, the Normans, Edward III, Edward V, uh, the kings in Scotland. And um, you start to get information about, you know, after the Great Fire, um, how the royal arts really started to take hold in England and, um, you know, was a, a reason why um, a lot of the uh, architecture after the Great Fire was so styled, you know, because of its, uh, you know, because masonry was deeply embedded in the hearts and minds of all these people, and that's how they constructed their buildings. Excuse me for one second. Five minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just want to stop for a second and talk about the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, only because James Anderson decided that they were a little bit different than what was traditionally taught to people. So um, according to James Anderson, they were the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, uh, the Mausoleum or the Tomb of Masalus at Halicarnassus, the Lighthouse of Pharos at Alexandria, Phidias' Statue of Jupiter Olympus, and finally the Colossus at Rhodes. Um, Interestingly enough, the original uh, seven ancient wonders of the world were um, uh, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, but uh, James Anderson removed that one and instead inserted the Temple of Solomon, I guess to give some credence to the Temple of Solomon being the seven ancient wonder, but it was not traditionally so. So now we're gonna get into the charges. Uh, so after that 40 page history of the craft, uh, which again, if you've never read it before, it's really interesting. Um, it's available everywhere. It's on archive.org, it's in the public domain, um, and it's been translated into modern English. Um, it's super interesting to read. So, so I implore you to read it and I'll put a link to a, a good translation of it. But now we get into the actual charges of a Freemason, what you will all start to see in your, your own Ahiman Razones, um, if your grand jurisdiction calls on them. So it, it'll, and I'll just touch on them lightly. Um, so again, concerning God and religion, um, Anderson's constitution tells you to obey the moral law um, and never be a stupid atheist nor a irreligious libertine. Um, and that Masons were charged in their country to be of the religion of that country or nation, whatever it was. Um, but it's more expedient to oblige them to that religion in which all men agree. Really, really, really um, forward thinking and liberal thoughts you find here in Anderson's Constitution. You don't normally find that in 18th century um, Protestant England, right? Of the civil magistrate, the Mason is to be a peaceful subject to the civil powers, where have we all heard that before? Of lodges, he defines a lodge as a place where Masons assemble and work. Um, or a duly organized society of Masons is called a lodge. And every brother ought to be a member of one and it should have bylaws. Um, then he gets into uh, Masons and, and uh, what they should be doing at work. Um, things like only candidates may, uh, you know, can only be an apprentice if their master doesn't have any other apprentice, so only taking one apprentice at a time. That's where that comes from. Um, no brother can be a warden until he's been passed to the fellow of the craft. Okay, so again, you got to remember when this was originally printed, there was still only a two degree system. You had an apprentice and fellow of the craft degrees. You did not have the master mason as a separate degree. Um, but to be a warden, you had to be a fellow of the craft. Um, nor can you be a master until you have acted as a warden. Nor could you be a grand warden until you've been master of a lodge. Nor a grand master until he had been a fellow craft and a master of his lodge. So 
uh, the management of the craft and working things like you shall work honestly in working days and live credibly on holy days and you know observe you know the Sabbath and things like that. A lot of the things you'll hear uh, at least here in the United States and, and in Virginia specifically during um, the uh, installation of the worshipful master. Now they talk about the grandmaster and his authority when they can congregate. Um, that each lodge should have its own bylaws. Um, things like restrictions. Um, let me see if there's. So you may have heard this before in in your uh, modern craft lodges. No lodge shall make more than five new brethren at one time, nor any mate, nor any man under the age of twenty five. Um, we've obviously changed that. Who must be his own master unless by dispensation from the grandmaster um, or under bondage, things like that. So again, you've heard this before. Um, as far back as 1721, you have examples of time frame for inquiry, giving your brothers time to look into the character of a candidate. Okay, um, this isn't a thing that popped up just recently. You know, where uh, at least in my jurisdictions, um, when we receive a petition for membership, you have to lay it over for a certain amount of time to give all the members of that lodge time to look into that person's character or to ask questions about it. I mean, again, you got to think this isn't the time of the internet. So um, they gave you one month's time. Um, so this is all by letter and by horse and stuff like that. It's not like it is today where you get an email saying, oh, you know, Chris Douglas wants to be a Mason. And, you know, you go search him up on Facebook and you see that he's a great guy. Um, <laughs> um, again, so they had one month's time to inquire into this person's character. Um, and again, this is the first time you see in Anderson's constitutions that the ballot has to be unanimous for membership. Okay, not by a majority, but by unanimous. Um, it required that Masons that were members of lodges, um, they had certain qualifications for charity. You had to set aside a certain amount for charity of your brother. And it was expected that if you needed charity, that the lodge would hold aside a certain amount for you. It also had the concept of demit and new lodges. So if you wanted to leave and join a new lodge, uh, the interesting thing here, um, you know, which holds credence to what scholars think about how, you know, before the premier Grand Lodge of England, lodges did things a little bit differently um, because it talks about in the demit part, um, before you demit and join another lodge, make sure you are accustomed to the, the customs and the practices of that individual lodge because they may not be the same as your lodge. Um, so they implore you to go to that lodge and see what, um, what practices and what rituals they have. Again, there was no formalized ritual, right? Um, and again, the funny part is the first time there's formalized ritual in England, at least, a written document ritual came from a Masonic expose and not from a Grand Lodge document. And then finally, it starts to go into, um, and I won't bore you with all these, um, the rules surrounding visiting other lodges and uh, the conduct of business of the Grand Lodge. When does the Grand Lodge need to meet? Um, what composes the Grand Lodge, things like that. But it did, that it, it required that it must have a quarterly communication around the dates of Michael Mass, Christmas, and Lady Day, um, and at some convenient place that the Grand Master shall appoint. Um, that every master and warden was required to be there and they could not be there. And if they could not be there, they had to have a dispensation. So it was required of you. Um, all matters determined by the Grand Lodge was determined by a majority of votes each member having one vote, and just like in modern jurisdictions, the grandmaster having two votes. So yay him. Um, it talked about the requirements for becoming a grand officer, the protocol for business, um, what consisted in abuse of power. Um, and also there was a requirement, um, which a lot of our, our modern lodges do today, that um, the grand line must visit all subordinate lodges. Now, if you're a member of the premier grand lodge of England, you know, there's only a few lodges, so it wasn't a big deal. But if you're in a large jurisdiction, they probably take a long time to do. So, and they didn't have cool things like Zoom uh, to help support them. But the grandmaster was required at least once during his term to visit a lodge during his grandmastership. Uh, the sad bits: what to do if the grandmaster dies, who takes over? Um, interestingly enough, it's not the deputy grandmaster. Um, according to Anderson's constitution, this obviously has changed. But uh, if the Grand Master passes away during his term, the immediate past Grand Master would then take over, not the Deputy Grand Master. But then they would stop, have to have an election, and then, you know, normally the, the line of progression happens according to its, its regular style. Um, this is my favorite part of it. Um, you were required to have feasts. 
So my uh, my my British brethren, um, you guys are lucky because you have way more feasts than we do here in the states. Um, but feasts and banquets were a really important part of Grand Lodge proceedings. Um, so at the annual communication, um, either on St. John's the Baptist Day or St. John's the Evangelist Day, um, you were required to have a feast and you were required to attend. The masters and the wardens of each lodge were required to be there. Um, and there was required toasts and things like that. Again, if you've been to lodges in the UK, um, you know that this is normally the order of course of business. Uh, if you've been to what here in the United States we term as a, as a table lodge, you may get a little inkling of what that looks like. It's definitely not the same. Um, it's more along the lines of a, a, a table lodge and a festive board put together. Um, so if none of you have never been to that, I encourage you to go visit and, and definitely go do that. Normally, um, at least my TO lodge will hold it around um, uh, St. John's Day in December, um, but we'll have a table lodge and a festive board. Um, but again, these were requirements. Um, it wasn't a nice to do, it was a you had to do. Um, and then again, the uh, the stewards uh, they take up a good uh, like a good whole page in Anderson's Constitution. But the stewards were actually stewarding; they were setting tables and putting out place cards and making sure that people showed up and keeping out talents and eavesdroppers. So if you were not a fellow of the craft and you were not invited, you could not go. So why are these so important? Um, uh, why do we talk about these old documents in such a reverent way? Um, because they really are the major compilation of, of documents for organized Freemasonry as we understand it today. Um, most importantly for me, they compile that definitive history of the craft for dissemination to all the brethren. This is the beginnings of the York Rite legend. Um, and they list the basic rules of governing lodges, grand lodges, and then the communications that they need to hold. Um, they defer the rules of an individual lodge to the bylaws, which again, we, we understand that today. You know, we have the laws from our Grand Lodge and then we also have bylaws as a lodge. We're required to have bylaws with our charters. Um, this is actually a misnomer on the slide. I, I keep forgetting to change it. Um, they define the landmarks. They actually don't define the landmarks. And this really sasses me about Anderson's constitution. Um, they reference being beholden to the ancient landmarks, but nowhere in this document does it actually um, state what they are. Um, and then finally, feasts. We don't have enough feasts. Um, here in the US, we think of this. But you know, but in Anderson's constitutions, they command us to have feasts on or around the feast day of St. John the Baptist or St. John the Evangelist, which are strikingly close to the summer and winter solstices. So they, these old charters provide a framework of, for what masonry is, right? Geometry and how that knowledge traveled from its allegorical beginnings in Genesis to the antediluvian times to the then present day of the 1700s. Um, they give us a decent insight into the history that we pull from our initiations. They place the story of our search for light in the context of many historical and quasi-historical places and times and, and really give us a beautiful and, and rich depth of history. They show the transition in thought from the purely operative lodges to the speculative craft and the purpose of the education in those degrees. They denote the universality of masonry from its usage in ancient cultures and the migration of that secret wisdom from biblical Genesis to the flood, to Egypt, to the ancient Western cultures, and finally to the height of civilization at the time of their writing, Europe and, and most specifically England. They define the purpose of Freemasonry. And if you read the text and put it all together, most of these documents are saying the same thing over and over and over again. It's the secret wisdom that is passed down from that Adam archetype or, or first man through the pre-flood civilization to the post-flood civilizations and onward to modern times. And it's that the study of how the world works, it forms, it's designed, and the hidden machine that governs the underlying motions of creation is what masonry is or is what geometry is and that we are the guardians of the way to understand how the world works how the universe works and, and in that knowledge and understanding we can try at least in a, in a very small part to understand that we are all part of that grand design we measure and learn the external so that we can appreciate and acknowledge the beauty within and in so hopefully we can learn a little bit more about our creator so that's the big secret of freemasonry all laid out for you amidst these documents um, if you choose to read them. Uh, learning about how, the how and the what of creation can help us understand the why. And in that understanding, we grow to love more about creation than we, than we ever did before. So again, that, that's the great mystery. 
spoiler alert, um, that's a lesson we're implored to learn. And, and we really have, have bastardized a little bit over centuries into, you know, a flaccid dinner club that can barely pay its rent. Um, so when we chief in that process of learning these mysteries and all the hard work that people put into it centuries before, um, some of us, not all, I mean, definitely not the folks that are here uh, that look to, to learn and educate and share, um, but a lot of us, we, we denigrate its original intent. Here's the references, and uh, this concludes my uh, presentation. So I'll stop sharing and uh, open the floor for questions. And uh, Chris, did you want me to knock out the questions that were in the chat first? If you would, please. Oh, I did want to say one thing. Um, the first landmark is we don't talk about the landmarks. <laughs> Man, don't, listen, I, I spent, I spent, when I, when I, I incorrectly put that, you know, as defining the landmarks, but he references the ancient landmarks four times in his original constitutions, right? Not the, not the ones that were printed by Ben Franklin. Um, he mentions them four different times, but he yet never defines them. There, does anybody know the earliest time the ancient landmarks were first put to paper? I'm not a oh, so I heard it. No, they were not put to paper. Right. The earliest time they were put to paper was in the 1850s by Mackey. Yeah. Okay. So almost 150 years later is when somebody actually put them down to paper, and now they're all different, right? We had Mackey's original 25 landmarks. Okay. Some places have 40. Each oh, Grand Lodge has their own set of landmarks. Um, somebody talking about beating somebody if we throw them on mute. Um, it's definitely not me and, and don't beat your brother's friends. Um, so let's go through these questions. So yeah, if you want to know, again, uh, the earliest known writing of the landmarks is Mackey, Mackey's 25 landmark. Um, I did want to say, years, Joe, if I could, um, yeah, about the landmarks, cause I've researched them a little bit and there's one, I forget some Masonic author said, if you were to write down all of the ancient landmarks, it would basically cheapen them to enumerate them. We should all should just know them. And it was basically saying, if you write it down, then they don't work anymore or something like that. It was kind of strange. Um, it is interesting. Every Grand Lodge has their own definition and we, we overlap. The vast majority of them, we all would recognize and say, yes. Probably if you heard most of the ancient landmarks, you would say, yeah, I agree with that. But not every, every Grand Lodge, if they enumerate them, they're all a little bit different, which is interesting. Right, and some of them put them in their their grand constitutions, right? Like Virginia does not, right? right. We just have them. They're not in our, we call our, our constitutions the methodical digest in Virginia. Um, but we don't list the ancient landmarks, but they're listed on our website. So, you know, the ones that we conform to that most of the, uh, you know, Conference of Grand Masters um, supports, to, supports, but they're not part of our um, grand constitutions. But if you go to another jurisdiction like North Carolina, um, or the ones that actually have their grand constitution called the Ahiman Razon, um, they are listed there. Um, so those that use the Ahiman Razon style of grand constitutions, they are listed and delineated, and they're different what? than Mackey's 25. So that's what, again, that's what kind of chaps my butt is Anderson mentions these ancient landmarks so many times, but doesn't define what they are. Mm -hmm. So somebody was talking about them way back in the 1720s, but it wasn't until Mackey. Yeah, it was so I digress. Let me uh, get to the questions. And, what are y'all uh, doing? Um, what's the questions here? Uh, so the first question I saw was, oh, put a link to Brother Sean's page. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, I'll also put it on the um, on your Facebook page as well. Um, but it's called basically the Formation Masonic Study Group by Sean Iyer. Um, again, all of the funds support the GW Memorial. He doesn't get paid for it. But if you're interested in old Masonic documents from an academic perspective, it is a phenomenal class. You're going to see Masonic documents you've never heard of, and they are going to Turn your ear sideways, the stuff that's written in them. Um, really amazing stuff. Um, Brother Stephen, yep, I'll send you my contact info. Uh, Brother Ineth, correct, the Masonic Order of Athelstan. Now, some jurisdictions don't have the Masonic Order of Athelstan. We do here in the States, and I know in the UK and some other uh, UK-based charter systems, they do have that as well. Um, but that's an independent body um, here in the United States. Uh, you had to, I think you just have to be a Master Mason, or do you have to be a Royal Arch Mason as well? Does anybody know? I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the initiation process is actually quite beautiful. You learn about the York Rite legend and, and King Athelstan himself. Um, really interesting. 
So the first question I see was, uh, what do you mean when you say geometry and masonry are synonymous terms? Uh, what I mean by that is, um, well, first of all, that's part of our ritual, right? Um, geometry or masonry originally synonymous terms. Um, it, you're going to see uh, in Anderson's constitutions, you're going to see in the Cook manuscript, and you definitely see in the Hallowell manuscript, how each author says geometry and masonry are interposed. They mean exactly the same thing. Okay. And when I write about them, I'm going to use them and interpose both of those words together. So geometry and masonry mean exactly the same thing. They mean a little bit differently now in the modern sense, right? But uh, back in the times of those writings, they meant the exact same thing. And that's how you should read them when you read those old charges and don't distinguish between the two, especially when you get to um, something like uh, uh, the Dowlin manuscript, um, when he talks about, you know, uh, the history before Euclid and things like that, he uses the word geometry over and over and over again, but it really means masonry. And then next question was, who is listed as the author of Anderson's Constitution? Ha ha. So it was not James Anderson. Um, poor guy. Um, again, he, he got stuck in as a footnote, but he was uh, paid to create these documents by uh, some say by Desiglier, um, you know, paid to have those documents created. Uh, but in the original document, it's listed as William Hunter as the printer. Um, but again, there's uh, if any UK brothers can enlighten me uh, from what I've read, it's a uh, it's a mishmash between um, you know the first grandmaster and Desiglier who actually said, "Hey, create these constitutions for us." And the next question I see: How did he calculate the year from Adam to Moses and to Abraham uh, through the genealogies? Um, and how long he expected, you know, how long they lived, things like that. I think Adam was listed as having lived 930 years um, in the King James Version of the Bible. And remember, this was when the King James Bible was in full force um, in England, right? Um, it had existed for about 100 years at the time. Um, Usher definitely used the King James Version of the Bible plus Latin, earlier Latin sources. Um, but uh, he took the dates based on the, you know, the dates that people lived and died. Um, that were found most notably in the King James Version of the Bible. But you do see in, in some letters that Usher wrote how he was using things, especially around the time of the New Testament, uh, based on Roman records, which, again, is really scholarly for, you know, uh, a religious archbishop, right? right. I, got, um, I, I figured it was something like that, because it says in the Bible, clearly, Adam lived X number of years and then had a son. At this age, he had a son, and then you can see how long that's. So you can... You can put it together. I remember once for fun, I calculated Methuselah because Methuselah is the oldest man. I think I figured it out once. I may be wrong, but basically he lived right up until the flood. So if I wasn't wrong in my math, Methuselah was born, lived a long, long, long time. And then Noah came along and Noah was like 600 when the flood came and Methuselah died in the flood. Possibly. I may be off of my math, but I remember as like a teenager figuring that out and I mean, no, absolutely right. It, um, it makes sense. For those of you, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I'll plug a little, um, for those of you that have seen the movie Noah with um, Russell Crowe. Um, now, yeah, that's some, definitely some weird stuff in there, um, you know, for the purposes of Hollywood. But um, in terms of biblical names and histories, they got it pretty much right, right? They had Methuselah there as, um, you know, Noah's father. And, um, uh, a lot of the history surrounding um, getting, I'm getting some side chatter from the Scottish brethren here. They're mad at me um, that I didn't mention the Shaw statues. You're absolutely right. Um, I did not mention the Shaw statues, but um, yeah, they are important documents. Um, so for the Scottish brethren, I will, I will show you some love. So the Shaw statues were published probably around 1598. Um, and they gave a code of rules governing the activities of operative masonry in Scotland, right? Um, the second statute was written in 1599, and it talked about the uh, organization of lodges um, and the formation of Lodge Kill Winning, or Lodge Number Zero. So definitely, I, I not being a, a uh, English Mason by birth, um, you know, I would definitely show love to Lodge Number Zero. Um, but I know you guys fight about that all the time um, between Scotland and England. Um, but it is the prototype of, and, and definitely I, I would have to say that Anderson did pull from things like the Shaw statutes and things like that. Um, now those statutes, if I, if I recall correctly, and someone chime in if, if I'm incorrect, the statutes were found in a minutes book. They weren't a separate document that was created and published as the same, right? Come on, Scottish brothers, you, you, got, you jumped on me for not mentioning it, so I'm in. 
Okay, I'm gonna assume I'm right. Um, so I don't, again, I don't think they were separate documents. Um, and you will have to go fight with the UGLE for why they don't. Uh, I can't mute people. Uh, so sorry for the side chatter there. Um, so brother Ron, uh, I mentioned the Shaw statute before you. There you go. Um, and yes, it did mandate the taking a minute. One of my most favorite things in masonry is uh, not so much the taking a minute, but the reading of the minute. So, Without minutes, uh, there's no meeting. <laughs> man, don't get me started. Did, are those all the, all the chat questions? Yes, sir. All right, I wanna open up the floor. If anyone has a question, please unmute and ask Joe a question. He covered a lot of material there, I know. That's why I was, I, I'm glad you waited. I realized I was easy to distract you. If I just typed a chat, you'd stop and read it, which is, need a little work on that, brother, but other than that, <laughs> you're easy to distract. But I thought it was like, if, if I write it down when I hear you mention it, you'll answer at the end because I would have forgotten by the end of it because you covered a lot of material in a short time. So a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, my OCD was on fire today, so I apologize. That's all right. Uh, please unmute and, oh, did we get Ernie? Oh yeah, uh, multi-pousies. Multi you see that one from Ernie? Multi-pousies. M-U-L-T-I. P A U C I S. Lovers of Freemasonry. Joe? You're muted, Joe. I've never heard of that. What is that? Um, some say it was the Dermot from Ireland who was against Anderson, had a few arguments with him, and he brought out something um, which was saying he was wrong. And he, and he titled it multi -Porses. But nobody knows the author. So I wondered if you'd heard anything about it. I've not, but I just Googled it, and I see it is a... Um... Yeah, I actually just Googled it. It is a, yep, you are, yeah, I'm gonna have to do a bit more research into it. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll incorporate it into, yeah, you're right. It is a response to Anderson's constitutions written around 1760 something, yeah. but they don't know who the original author was, but it was presented, um, it was presented to the Lodge of Research in uh, England around 1903. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, so, I'll actually give it a look. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll mute again. I'll mute. Great, I'll put the link. Uh, it looks like it was a paper written um, at MIT. I'll put the link in the uh, chat box here. Okay, so it. Yeah. Any question? Any other questions? <laughs> I guess you just stun them into silence. <laughs> well, I know the old charters isn't the most exciting of things, um, but I, I did try to find some uh, interesting points about it. But uh, again, for me, it's that the, the takeaways for me are that that allegorical history, I think it's really beautiful because it gives us a rich, richer history than, oh yeah, we took some stonemasons and we made them cool because their patrons joined the lodges and then we started talking about, you know, religion and alchemy and all this cool stuff. Um, no, I think it, it gives it a, a predefined history, which again, while allegorical, is still really beautiful. You have a question? Joe, uh, I'd just like to thank you uh, on behalf of everyone. That was um, the most interesting and extensive uh, list of um, the historical documents I've ever heard. So I thank you very much and I appreciate it. And <clears throat> Christopher, I you know, maybe in a couple of months, I wouldn't mind hearing it again, and I'll take some more notes. I was just absorbing, but it'll you know, be on. It'll the, be on YouTube for you to watch. Oh, well, that's again. right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I forgot how good you are about that. Yeah. But thank you very much, uh, brother Joe. You uh, 
you presented it very um, uh, lively too. You know, that could be the driest topic known to mankind, but uh, you did a great job on that presenting. Thank you, most kind. Um, yeah, no, uh, really kind words. Like I said, I when I started doing, uh, you know, I've, I've done this presentation for a couple of years now and it did start off very dry, but once I started actually reading the documents themselves, um, and again, you gotta get good translations and that's why I'm gonna plug uh, Brother Sean Iyer again. Um, he finds the most interesting and, and really researched translations for old documents. Again, Middle English is not fun to read. Um, if any of you here have tried to read Middle English, it sucks. Um, and especially for, uh, you know, a uh, Latino kid who grew up in New York, I didn't grow up in <laughs> Middle English. So, um, you know, that's not my bag. But um, yeah, really, if you can find some good translations, um, once you get to the meaning of what they were writing, um, how well, super interesting, um, but it's really hard to read, you know, but mm -hmm. for those that, you know, for all those that last SOMO to be on Facebook and Twitter, um, that's where that term comes from. And it tells you what it means. Um, you know, and, and how, uh, you know, that's the earliest time you see the term so to be. Um, but it had meanings outside of masonry. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Brother Joe. Is. Now, um, was there that one author you said that's done some of the best translations? Like, are his little booklets available? Like, can you get them on Amazon? So, uh, so uh, I'll put the link to Sean Iyer's, uh, Thank you. again, it's Brother Sean Iyer. Uh, he's a mason in D.C. and some, in California, I think. Uh, but he's Beautiful. also, um, he runs stuff at the George Washington Masonic Memorial. And again, after COVID, he put together basically a online study group for um, early Masonic texts, right? Uh, that'd so be awesome to, if, to follow yeah, if you think, if you think Anderson is, is the end all be all, you're absolutely wrong. There were so many documents written around the 1720s and 1730s, which you guys, I promise you, you've never heard of. Um, they're not well published, you know what I mean? But they're really... Very amazing awesome. in, in what they contain. I'll put a, oh, there it is right there. Thanks, Brother John. Um, Masonic Formation. Again, all you have to do is donate to the George Washington Memorial um, because they're not doing tours now, right? So a lot of that income that they normally get from doing tours doesn't exist anymore. So they're, 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 they need help. Um, and uh, yeah, the text that you go into, there's my favorite one. It's called Masonry Triumphant or the book M. If you've never heard of that, you need to stop what you're doing right now and download that. It is the most amazing early Masonic text you've ever read. Um, it's so cool. Um, Joe, again, there's a yeah. question from Michael Joyner. That was some reference to someone in England prior to Alpha Stan. Who was that? Oh, uh, well, you had Alban, his father. Um, I do know that. Um, but uh, can you elaborate on that? That was the brother, brother Michael Joyner asked the brother question. Michael. I think it was St. Albion that, or it yeah, it was, it was about, uh, Athelstan was listed as 900. This was about 700 AD. Remember that when Go you- Go back to the slides. Uh-huh. I didn't write down the name at that time. Okay. Yeah, his oh, father was to... Albion. Is that St. Albion or is that someone? Now it's St. Alban, yeah, he was- Okay, Alban, yeah, okay. Yep, let me go back to the slides here, brother. Okay. If it's 200 years earlier, I don't think it was him. So we'll check I thought it was around something around 700, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting period. There's not much going on around then. No, that was, um, am I still on mute or am I off mute? But you're off mute. Okay. Um, so the 741 reference was to Charles Martel, the King of France. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, the statement is, I'll read you the whole sentence. Uh, Yet becoming a free people and having a disposition for masonry, they soon began to imitate the Asiatics, the Grecians, and the Romans in erecting of lodges and encouraging of masons, being taught not only from the faithful traditions of the Britons, but even by foreign princes, in whose dominions the royal art had been preserved from Gothic ruins, particularly by Charles, Charles Martel, King of France, who, according to the old records of masons, sent over several expert craftsmen and learned architects into England at the desire of the Saxon kings. So there's that transmission from France to England that you see mentioned in all the other older old charges. Excellent. Thank you. Other questions? Going once. <laughs> all right. Uh, Brother Martinez, I greatly appreciate this. This was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. This is exactly we are on a path now. I'm not sure where that path is going, but I think we're on that path now. We're getting more and more interesting talks and a lot of 
questions and chatter. That's what I've been trying to cultivate here is get more. I don't like going to things where and lodges where a guy gets up, gets a fascinating talk and not one person bothers to ask a question to elaborate on it. I mean, it's all about, we're supposed to, I'm trying to draw you all out and get you all interacting with each other. And the conversations can actually be as enlightening as the paper sometimes because you bring up other points that we should consider. No, and, so and, we're and moving in that first, direction. Yeah, I mean, let me tell you, first off, you know, thank you for uh, putting this all together. Um, you know me, I love seeing uh, Masonic education. Um, and I got, sorry, I got a bunch more direct messages for folks. Um, so I'll, I'll put it in the, Chat. The brother's name is Sean Iyer, um, and Brother Felty put up the uh, Facebook link to the Masonic Formation group. But if you go to Facebook, it's called Masonic Formation. Um, and uh, you know, I'll put a link to it on uh, on the uh, Facebook page, uh, Brother Chris, if you don't mind, um, just so folks can go reference it there. I um, will. Back, we'll, we'll go. Ahead, back to my thought. thank yous. Yeah, yeah. I want to say thank you for putting this together, man. Um, you know me, I, I love Masonic education and, uh, you know, I'll plug Refractive Light again for those of you that, um, Brother Chris does a fantastic job and he is a, uh, he's in the minority, you know, when it comes to spreading light online, you know, it's still a re relatively new thing. Um, and, and Brother Chris does it, you know, under the auspices of, of the Virginia Research Lodge. So for those of you that are um, Masons and stuff, you, you, you gain the benefit of it. Um, for those of you that have people that are interested in Masonry, um, that are not Masons, that are members of other esoteric orders, or just feel like, again, I'm going to make the same statement I, I made at the very beginning. The secrets of Freemasonry are not things that are, are the tiled things, right? Um, they're not the grips, the signs, and the words. Um, those are nice to have. So those, aren't, those aren't the real secrets of Freemasonry, to me at least, right? Um, but those truths are a bit more universal. Um, so if, if you are open to open groups and things like that, um, definitely check out Refractive Light. I'd say 75% of it is Masonic. Um, you do get some information about other orders like Golden Dawn, things I'm not members of, um, but uh, you know, ancient mysteries, things like that um, without getting too weird and ancient aliens, you know? Um, but if you're interested in that, go check out Refractive Light. Um, it does pretty much um, a lot of things that Brother Chris does, but um, again, it's open to all, it's not restricted to Master Mason. Um, and uh, it's just another place to spread light. Excellent. Thank you. Um, if you are not a member, as you mentioned, this is hosted by Virginia Research Lodge. Um, in fact, one of these meetings, I think I'll do a, a brief synopsis of what a research lodge is. I mean, we all, I think most of us here know, but it's worth bringing it up again. Um, but uh, we have a Facebook group. I think many of you are members. If you're not, then the person who no, invited no, no, you no, here Colby, was a member. Right and I thank like, Brother Brian yeah, and all the others yeah, who are yeah, uh, spreading yeah. the virus as best they can. This is a positive virus uh, <laughs> of, uh, of enlightenment. And I really appreciate everyone who's coming in from all these other countries. But if you're not already a member of our Facebook group, I put the link in the chat. Um, and I will be publishing the chat in our um, on our Facebook page. Uh, usually when I am doing the YouTube, when I get it to YouTube, I'll come back and put the chat underneath it. So it's all available there on our, our group page. And I welcome you to come check that out. There's a lot of good information there. We'll put in there. And um, we do the, these chats every Saturday at 10 is a regular thing for our, our Zoom meetings. And my son is, is uh, running his mouth in the background because he didn't listen to me when I said I'm having a recording. So uh, that's my son, Isaac playing some online game and uh, his dad's directions. That sounds a lot like my kids playing Xbox online. Yes. I don't feel bad. Well, he's like in the same room with me. So, and I have an excellent microphone. Uh, I will give a, a free plug for okay, skull candy cool. headphones. These things are cheap. They're like 15 bucks. This is the most powerful mic I've ever had. I've had zoom meetings for work where my wife's phone is two rooms away and it plays the star Wars theme as the ringtone and people accuse me of watching a movie during the zoom meeting. So it's like, no, no, it's, it's just your phone. It's just a really good mic, but this can pick up anywhere in my house. These are excellent mics and these are dirt cheap headphones. So go figure, but I know it picks up absolutely everything around me. So I apologize for the background noise. That was mostly me. Um, Brother John Mallon, you had a question. Please. Yeah, Brother Christopher, um, I'd, I'd like to just say thanks very much um, from Scotland. Um, I'm a member of Lodge 419 uh, Neptune. 
Um, and to brother um, Joe for his very interesting and informative talk. It's very enlightening and it's great to see all the brothers here, you know, in these difficult times, you know. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, now I'm trying to get ahead of myself and actually have the Zoom meetings ready to go out with the weekly emails. I was getting into that. We have a weekly email of our research papers. I publish them every week. They're available on the group page, but I also email them. We have over a thousand brothers who have signed up individually to get these papers. And they're going to about 1500 people between the lodge uh, group list that I already have access to. So you're more than welcome to sign up. If you join the Facebook page, you are not automatically added to the email. So when I ask if you're getting the emails, don't come and tell me you aren't if you haven't messaged me to sign up. But you please, know, like you're more than welcome to um, sign up for the, uh, for the for the weekly emails. And I'll, I'll be putting the Zoom meetings every week with that. So trying to be ahead of the game. So when you get the email list, you'll get the Zoom meeting for that Saturday. But it's also on the Facebook page, so you can go find it there. And I'm trying to have my topics lined up ahead so I can give a little plug for next week. Next week will be traditional observance masonry. Anyone here who is a member of a traditional observance lodge or has attended one, please attend. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some written stuff and I'm going to actually do like in kind of an interview of the group. I will ask questions of those of you who actually attend. Mm -hmm. You'll have more useful information than I do. I can read Brother Hammer's book and get an inkling and I will have some quotes from that book, uh, Observing the Craft. But I want to actually interview some of you all. It'll just be quick questions like, well, what is this like? What is this like? So please uh, message me if you're willing to be interviewed and just attend and I'll be asking questions of you all um, so we can get a better understanding of what a traditional observance lodge is, mm -hmm. what it's about, can we bring it about, do, and I have a whole bunch of stuff that I've been wanting to ask and I'm sure other people are interested too. If you've never heard of it, traditional observance is a more modern effort, I'd say within mm -hmm. the last 10 years or more, to kind of return to what we think the original masonry was. Mm -hmm. And Brother Joe is spot on when he says, we are not doing masonry, we're doing a pale imitation of it. And I'm all in favor of doing more of it because that's what brought me to this. So I think talking about TO and sharing how it actually works or not works, and if you can integrate it into your current lodge without starting over with a new lodge, and. I'm going to be bringing up all of that, and uh, so I hope that's enough of a teaser to get you all come back. But it's going to be all traditional observance all the time next meeting, and I hope that'll be interesting for you all. If you have a topic, if you are a speaker, if you have a paper you want to present, or you have a suggestion for a, a um, kind of show I can do in the future, please let me know, mm -hmm. because right now I'm planning on every Saturday for the foreseeable future having talks. Mm -hmm. And I want to have something to present every meeting, not just sit here and gab, as fun as that is. I want to kind of have a purpose to each meeting. But it's still we're just going to keep it casual. So please Sorry. contact me. I, I need topics. Brother Christopher, just in case, I, <clears throat> good brother George Ashram there gave me a wake up call yesterday to make sure I come on. And I don't, can you just share to everyone? your uh, email contact again, in case I lost track of it, please, sir. And then I'll connect with you better. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't mind giving out my email. Um, oh, I'll just Thank send you, it brother. to Brian. Hold on. I just sent it to Brian. There you go. Hey, hey. Uh, let me send it to Eric. It, it defaults to, it keeps defaulting to, uh, uh, to a person, not to the group. So, I've spammed a couple of y'all individually. Okay. That is my email address. I posted earlier, if you look in the chat, I'm gonna go, go grab it and put it again. All of this information will be on our Research Lodge page. So if you missed it, thank you, brother. In the chat. But, just wanted to make sure. Sorry yeah, about that. Um, but that's my email. And um, and it's a, a couple of people are asking the same question. A traditional observance lodge is what I was talking about. People keep asking what a service lodge is. It's TO or traditional observance lodge. And if you want to know more about it, you got to come back next week. 
So there. <laughs> That's a very good challenge, I accept. Uh, Brother Madeline, oh, please. Right, yeah, yeah. Hand up. yeah, yeah, brother, brother Christopher. I'm uh, I'm a musician, so if I sing and I also play a few sure. instruments, so if any if there's any time you ever want some kind of musical input, then please don't hesitate okay. to contact me. You know. Oh, very good. Yes, I will keep I'd that in mind. To do that. He I does wonderful. That. He did one uh, the other day with uh, the Scottish Regimental Lodge, and he did a great job. So I can vouch for him. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's say goodbye to Brother Joe before he leaves. Thank you, Joe. We really appreciate it. It was a great talk. And you're, yeah, thank you very much. It's you're in line beautiful. with where we're going. <laughs> okay, it's 1140. We do run long. I don't care if you don't care. But when I publish a YouTube, it's a good hour and a half or more. And if people want to watch them, that's great. But uh, please check out our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, we ha I will have this up. Uh, before the next one, I can make a pledge that every, I just did three in a row earlier this week. So I will make an effort to publish this on YouTube during the week. So Monday or Tuesday is when I publish the paper. I email it and put it on the group. And I set up the Zoom meeting today. So I'll have that to put in for Saturday. And sometime during the week, I'll publish to YouTube. And of course, Saturday morning will be the next. So I'm trying to get in a weekly routine here and do it at a regular time so you all know when. Uh, when to expect it. Anybody else have anything else to offer before we close out? Well, I do want to say thank you very much, Christopher. It was a great, great, great morning for us over here. Good. And and we will see you next Saturday. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Bye. All right. Thank you all very much for coming. We're going to go and close it out. Thanks again. We'll see you next Saturday. Bye-bye. God bless, brothers.